We're gonna have a seat. Before we get started, I want to know how many of you all are from Tucson. Raise your hands or clap. How many of you all are new to Tucson? So we have a lot of Tucsonenses in here. Awesome. long bios, so we'll make sure. <laughs> we got a couple more folks coming in. We're going to get started in 10, 9. Well, good morning, everyone. Buenos dias. I am Selena Barajas, and I would like to welcome you all to the 2024 Tucson Festival of Books. Yes. I would like to give a special thanks to right here, Nuestras Raices, for inviting. Yes, please give them a round of applause. To the staff in the back, if you could just say hi, if everyone could turn their heads this way, give them a, a big Look round of them. applause. Look at them. Thank you all for inviting authors and moderators like us to attend. You spark a lot of um, motivation for us to come and visit the Tucson Festival of Books. So thank you all again year after year. The festival organizers also thank Pima County Public Library and Pima Library Foundation for sponsoring this location in memory of Patricia Porter and the Friends of the Festival for sponsoring the upcoming discussion. The panel will end in one hour. Exactly. We'll have 15, 20 minutes for Q&A near the end of the session. Make sure after the, we are done to stop by the Pima County Public Library and, P, and Pima Library Foundation West Raisa stage signing tent for author signing and book sales after the session. Please stop by the foundation's table at the back of the tent to see how you can support your wonderful libraries and pick up a free bookmark. Everyone back there, stand up and wave at the Noises book sale signing. They're all the way over there. I don't know if they're busy passing out bookmarks. Look busy. But after this, you all could just mingle that way and support our local Tucson-born authors. Book sales at the festival help support the cost of the festival and the local literacy programs it funds. You can also help keep this event free and open to everyone by becoming a friend of the festival or a sponsor of the festival. Please stop by the Friends booth or visit our website, TucsonFestivalBooks.org. Before we begin, this is just a friendly reminder, please silence your phones inside conversations. <laughs> And if you do take any photos, please make sure to tag our authors. So joining us today for the panel, Voces Tucsonienses are Elizabeth Camarillo Gutierrez, Lydia Otero, and Henry Barajas. And I just want to give a little story in 2020. I was supposed to be their moderator for Lydia Otero and Henry Barajas. Uh, Lydia and I were actually having coffee, sitting down, going over the questions when we got a text message that COVID-19 hit and the festival was canceled. So I didn't think I would have this opportunity today to finally moderate both of their work. And I'm really excited. Four years in the making. Now, Henry Barajas, no relation. We're not cousins, not that I know of. <laughs> Tucson, we're all, we're cousins somewhere down the line. Um, is a Latinx author from Tucson, Arizona. He is best known for his graphic memoirs, La Voz de Mayo, Dr. Rambo, <laughs> TMT, Spring to Fate, Hem, 
Great Castle, Batman, Urban Legends, Project Cryptid, and the Eisner Award-nominated horror anthology, Crypt Show. Barajas writes guilt rope for the funny papers in Los Angeles, California. Now let's give Henry a round of applause. <laughs> Elizabeth Camarillo Gutierrez was born and raised in Tucson, Arizona. As a second generation immigrant, she graduated high school at the top of her class in 2018. Graduated from the University of Pennsylvania with a degree in philosophy, politics, and economics. She worked as a banking analysis at Wells Fargo and is now a product manager at a big tech company where she uses her background and knowledge to empower communities. She has been featured on NPR's Latino USA and delivered a viral TED Talk on finding opportunity and stability in the United States while examining flaws in narratives and narratives that simplify and idealize the immigrant experience. She lives in Brooklyn, New York. Her first book, My Side of the River, <laughs> is a memoir about her childhood in the US when at 15 years old, her parents were forced back to Mexico. Lydia Otero, or how I refer, Dr. Otero, <laughs> Received a PhD in history in 2003 and is an emeritus associate professor in the Department of Mexican American Studies at the University right here of Arizona. In 2011, their book, La Calle's Spatial Complex and Urban Renewal on a 1966 urban renewal project which targeted the most densely populated 80 acres in Arizona. Although Mexican Americans dominated the renewal area demographically, most of the city's Asian and African Americans also lived there. Building on these themes, Otero released In the Shadows of the Freeway, Growing Up Brown and Queer in 2019. Through photographs and archival documents, this book is a narrative of personal becoming amid the political and cultural currents of 1980s Los Angeles. The LA Times Gustavo selected LA Interchanges as one of his top four California memoirs of 2023. Yes. And LA Taco recognized it as one of the 2023 best books. So who's pumped up to hear our Tucson born author? I'll go ahead and allow all of our authors to just briefly introduce themselves. We'll start with you, Henry. Yes, cousin. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Henry Barajas. I'm born and raised in Tucson, Arizona. Happy to be here. Happy to be on this land that recognize the indigenous people, the Thoma Atom, the Pascualiaki people, and all the other people I'm forgetting to mention. Um, I recently wrote a comic book that is about Dolores Huerta, who I feel doesn't get enough recognition for the workers' rights, uh, the rights of, of uh, migrant people. Um, if you buy my graphic novel that's available for sale over there, uh, the last sentence I wrote was, I want to write a comic about Cesar Chavez and the Lord Huerta. So this is the unofficial sequel. It is free for children in the New York uh, public education system. It's available online digitally. Um, you can only get copies from me right now, which I'm giving away for free but for the first time charging for my autograph, which is worth nothing. Um, so, but you can read it online for free, but if you are someone who can't afford the $5, just let me know, I'll give you, I'll give you a special discount. 
Valeria. Hi everyone. I was born and raised in Tucson. I was born in 1955, so I consider myself the elder of this group. And uh, actually, that's something that Show I'm trying to get, get, trying to get into, like being an elder. Like I should be used to it, right? But it's, it's something new. Uh, I do want to start off my presentation by uh, by by saying that because it's the elephant in the room that I support Free Palestine and there was an issue with Raytheon contributing to this festival of books. Being born and raised here in Tucson, I hate that we're making and supporting bomb technology and making bombs that's causing destruction throughout throughout the world. So, uh, and, uh, we can start by urging Tucson Festival of Books not to take donations from Raytheon Network, not to make them part of this festival. I think that's really important. So my new book is about, so you, some of you have read about me growing up in Tucson, and then I left and, be, and was a queer activist in Los Angeles, and my newest book is about those 20 years I arrived in Los Angeles in 1978, and I left in 1998, and so my newest book is about those 20 years there. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm so happy to be here. This is the longest I've been back in Tucson, I think since I graduated high school, which was 10 years ago now. And it's crazy how much things have changed. Um, I'm very proud to have been born and raised here. My whole family is here, which is really exciting. My mom, dad, grandma, my uncle and aunt. So give them a big round of applause. I wouldn't be here without them and without the community that helped raise me. And part of my book, My Side of the River, is really honoring this community and the ways that it made me a stronger person, that it made me you know, be able to take on the world even when they didn't know how to tell me to take on the world, right? So yeah, I'm very happy to be here. I'm really happy to be next to these two amazing other Tucsonan authors. So yeah. Well, let's go ahead and get on with the show. This is a conversation for all of you. When did you realize you wanted to be a writer? I know you kind of dabbled into it in some of the books, but I, but for the audience, when did you all realize that that point? I'll start off. It was 1983, and I was at a lesbian the first and the only national lesbian of color conference, and I got to talk to Gloria Anzaldúa. And uh, she she was having these meetings, and she said, uh, I told her, you know, I just don't know what to do with myself and sometimes, and she said, you got to write. Well, in 1983, I was in the midst of training being an electrician in Local 11 in Los Angeles. I had no intention of writing. And then somebody told me, and Gloria told everybody to write. That's what she did. She'd meet people and she'd tell them to write. And, I, and I, I think, well, she told me to write. And just her saying that, like, stuck around in my head, right? And I think that's really important. So it, it opened up this idea or possibility that I could write. And I think that's when it first, it first came, came to me and it, and it stayed with me that I could possibly write. Well, okay. I don't want to be the guy who's like, well, uh, the only sister, you know. Um, I, it's like, I like to equate it to like, like a, a, a mama bird doesn't get taught to feed the birds and like to build a nest. It was just like an innate ability that I was thankfully just wanted to do. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think just the act of making comics as a kid and drawing and, and writing, and and that's the only thing I got good grades in. That was the only thing that like teachers did not worry about at all. Uh, I can't even look at a clock with numbers on it. Like uh, there's just some things in this earth that I'm not good at, and writing is the only thing that I think I'm pretty okay at. So apparently I've been a writer my whole life. I don't know if Miss C is here. She was at another, she was my elementary school librarian. Aww. And uh, apparently in first grade or something, I decided to start stapling pieces of paper together and writing little books. And I would illustrate them. And she says that it was funny because I, she could tell from the writing that I was still learning English. 
I would sometimes uh, pronounce, like I would spell things in the way that I thought it was pronounced maybe in Spanish. And so she was, she said it was really cute de developmentally. Uh, but this book, honestly, I didn't really expect to write it or ever thought, oh, I'm gonna write a memoir. I gave this TED talk in 2020, also right before the pandemic, and then I had a few agents reach out to me on Twitter, and I was like, scam. Uh, that's a scam. And so <laughs> I, I, I reached, I, I you know, started emailing and asking some friends in the publishing industry. I was like, do you know anyone in publishing um, that can tell me what's going on? Because there was at least two of them, and uh, eventually I got connected to my agent's former assistant. Uh, and that was, she told me, she's like, oh yeah, they are real agents, um, but also like, maybe you should just, you know, come with me. She ended up being my agent, she's amazing. She also represents Isabel Allende, so I was like, oh my God, starstruck. Uh, so she was really cool, and we, you know, formed this sort of proposal, and it turned into a book, and that's how this came to be. I wasn't you know, traditionally trained in writing, so every time I'm next to authors that have had some sort of training, I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> well, I'm glad you went into the journey because I do want to hear a little bit from um, Lydia and Henry. That's important, so we know we have, you have writing under your you know, foundation. What, for you both, what was your journey that led you to move forward with, with your, these two books, these two works that we have highlighted? Sure. Um, so, I don't have an agent, right? uh, I publish off the grid, uh, I think that uh, you would categorize my publishing in the genre of self-publishing even. Mm -hmm. uh, when I wrote La Calle, it was a, a popular book here in Tucson, so I have to credit you all, my readership, for supporting me because uh, when I published La Calle, I wanted to publish in the shadows of the freeway, and so I wrote it, and uh, it sold a lot of copies here. It was very popular, and, me and it meant a lot to people, uh, and, and I encountered people who wanted more of that style of writing that's just about local stuff, right? And so I never really studied writing. So then, my next book is about me leaving Tucson and writing about Los Angeles. So, I, you know, I'm, in this place now where I like writing, and the most important uh, advice to writers is to finish your project, <laughs> because that's the hardest thing. I have many books that I started, but I never finished in my lifetime. I hope to visit them. So it forces me, like I have a, a way to publish now, and it's, uh, and it's, it's gaining traction so that I can be that author without having these obligations to to a agent or to a publishing company. I write what I want, nobody edits what I write, so that I can say what I want to say. And it's worked out pretty well. But again, thank you to you all who, who, who were excited. I keep getting asked, when's your next book coming out? And there's this excitement that I just can't express because I'm just very thankful that, uh, that you all get what I'm trying to do and get what I'm trying to say. I um, had a similar road that I took where I made a comic book, which, um, no offense to the festival, but doesn't really recognize comics in a way that I think it should. And um, I did it as a crowdfunding experiment. So I was happy with 450 people buying it directly from me and, and having the opportunity to publish it with Image Comics, which is the third largest uh, comic book publisher in North America. And it just ballooned from there. So again, there's so many people here who you can find your name in the book. And thank you for all your support. It all started here. But um, yeah, it just, uh, it just it's, it's like we don't have enough time to say what we want to say. And we have to uh, put it out there and move on. And, and keep making something new and keep saying something that we feel that needs to be said. And, and that's what I'm really excited about the Dolores Huerta project, that it's a comic anyone can read if you have the access to the internet, uh, which is a luxury. And uh, if you are a kid in New York City, you get to read that. But um, yeah, just to echo what everyone's saying here is if you are a writer and you wanna write, just write it out 
put it out there and move on and keep writing because um, I've been in that space where I couldn't move on from some pieces and I feel very lucky that I have built a momentum and that people uh, want to hear what I have to say. I'm going to have you on the spot, TK, what you have to say. I'm going to go and ask the authors individual questions because although their work, you know, dabbles into different um, commonalities, each one is different. And for you, Henry, I'm curious to know how did you select your characters or topics like Dolores Huerta or when I was in 2020 when I received this book, um, you know, Tata Rambo. I saw an image of Pueblo High School and we have a lot of Pueblo warriors here in, in the, under the tent in, on stage. What goes into deciding on your characters and topics? Well, that's a good question. Um, I was at a very low point in my life when I started writing La Voz de Mayo. I hadn't written in a year. I was very depressed. And I, for whatever reason, at a point that I shouldn't have been thinking about my great grandfather. I hadn't heard from him in a long time, but something just kind of bolted into me and was like, hey, you need to do the, tell this story. That story dovetail into my other graphic novel, Helm Grey Castle. Uh, well, La Voz de Mayo, just to you know, explain, uh, La Voz de Mayo is about my great-grandfather, Ramon Jaurique, who co-founded the Mexican-American Yaqui Others organization that helped the Pascual Yaqui tribe gain federal recognition and uh, prevent the Interstate 10 from building through Old Pascua, which would have displaced thousands of people and would have, um, uh, would have, you know, I'd like to think that the Yaqui people are very resilient people and that no matter what would have happened to them, uh, they would have maintained their um, their tribe and their, uh, you know, traditions, but I think having them cemented in Old Pascua was a re really big help, so I wrote a graphic novel about that. That led in, into me learning about Mesoamerican history, which I had known nothing about. I made it create, you know, I love playing Dungeons and Dragons, so I wanted to um, fold in uh, Azteca into a fantasy world, which I thought it does itself in itself already. And while researching Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, that led me into writing the comic that I did for the New York Public Education. That research has led me into my next project, which is a Chicano Noir called Dead to Pachuco. That's about the um, Zoot Suit Riot that happened 81 years ago. That is leading into my next project uh, about the 1968 walkouts. So uh, it's like I'm, I never went to college. I don't um, have a degree, um, but I uh, am constantly reading and, and learning about the world that I'm really interested in and I'm thankful that I can partner with people like Jay Gonzo who did uh, La Voz de Mayo and all the illustrators and people that I get to work with to tell these stories using pictures and words. And you touched upon it a little bit here with the Festival of Books, but what do you find challenging or presents itself as an opportunity in the comic book industry? Uh, there's not a lot of people like me in the comic book industry. Uh, I've been threatening to change my name to uh, Jonathan Tom Taylor King. <laughs> Just because those three names you see on a lot of books, and if they're all three of them are on there, I think people would be really into that. Yeah. It also sounds like Jonathan Tom Taylor Thomas, which everyone loves home improvements. Um, but yeah, so there's just a lot of uh, barriers to, I mean, the, the first, the, uh, so the publisher asked me, Henry, why don't comics about, you know, brown people sell? And my question to him was, well, well how many of you publish this year? And zero. So, uh, so that you already have a preconceived notion that brown people's stories don't sell. And thankfully, thanks to you and everybody that has bought the book, we're almost, we only have 3, 300 copies out of four th almost 5,000 copies have sold. And I'm not having to look for another publishing house. And hopefully we can find one soon because it's become a very important learning tool. Here, I was just here last Wednesday talking to a class and having engaged with uh, college students uh, to talk about it, high school students. So um, that is a big problem, is having to constantly feel like a, a salmon upstream while there's a big bear trying to bat me and tear me open and eat me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Southwest generally. I come visit my family in Sonora every year around the holidays and then I end up staying for a little bit longer because the weather is so much better here than it is in New York. And I think a lot of the research that I did was just speaking to my family, speaking to my grandparents and getting the stories of their upbringing to my aunts and uncles. And a lot of the knowledge that they had is just like passed down generations. You don't know what's true and what's not but you kind of take what good learnings there are from what they say. I also spent a lot of time um, just trying to understand the native people that my family always said I was connected people, like the indigenous people, what their upbringing was and how over the years uh, the impact of climate change has affected them and how a lot of their history has been erased, but you can still see traces of them and what's left. And for me, that was really fun. I, I've always loved architecture, and I, I was really interested in looking at the churches that are in Sonora and that come up to Tucson and understanding who built these churches, which are an example of like Spanish architecture, but who actually knows how to use the dirt in the ground and make these walls and who were the brown hands that were doing it. So for me, that was all very interesting in like just understanding my background and the land that I was raised in. Now, when you got to writing your story, what were some of the challenges you faced on the road to publication? Yes, Elizabeth. I think a, a lot of writing a memoir is feeling like a raging narcissist. <laughs> and it, for me, my, my brain was my biggest obstacle. I mean, I, my my poor editor and agent, I kept asking for extensions, which I learned was something you can do in college for essays, but it's a little bit different when you have a book deal and the publishing house is like, well, you know, we kind of like need you to like, you know, close it up. And so when Lydia said that the hardest thing is finishing your work, she's so right because it took three years and I was like, and even even when I you know submitted the the, the the final draft, I was like, I don't know if I like it. And you know, my my agent and editor were like, No, it's good. And you know, at some point, you have to close that chapter and let it go and let the book exist with all its flaws and its virtues and whatever. And so, at the end, I'm I'm very happy that it's out in the world. I'm glad that that era is closed because it it, it is such a difficult journey. I think. Writing is so glamorized, and it is such a beautiful process, but it's so, so hard. And you don't realize how much it takes out of you until, you know, you're looking at your word count, and, you know, you know, books are supposed to be, what, like 80,000 words or something? And you're like, oh, I'm at 30,000. How am I going to get the next 50? Like, I don't know what I'm doing. So, yeah, it, w it was all a very difficult process for me, but I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad it came to fruition. But you did it, so. Yeah. <laughs> And Lydia, I, Lydia, I have a couple questions for you. Um, we we're walking over here, and you have that LA, Henry has that LA uh, connection. Obviously, I lived in Los Angeles for 10 years, so we talk about that Tucson LA connection. I don't know if you see Dodger Caps. I know there's Dodger Caps in the background. So, as a Tucsonense, how did this influence your work, especially when writing a book about living in Los Angeles? Right, so I met Henry in it. Um, so I think that, uh, well, I wrote LA Interchanges in Tucson, right, because I feel very grounded in Tucson. When I returned to Tucson in 1998 to go to enter a PhD program in history here, I thought I was going to go back to LA. But what was different is that returning to Tucson on my own terms was different than being a young queer wanting to leave Tucson to explore and be myself. So the, the, there was 20 years there that had passed, and I feel very grounded here. Uh, uh, you know, and it, it feeds my 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 interest. Now, in my books, I, I want to say La Calle too. In all my books. I, I look at the people, because you talked about your tios and your niece, uh, your, your, all your family. I do that too. 
I feel like write, when I write memoirs, um, I really am writing about people typically abandoned by history. So I'm very motivated to tell their story, make sure that their, their names are in a book, and that, that it's chronicled. And I think that you you do that too. Like, it, 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 and it's very uh, true even in LA interchanges. When I was writing that, I wanted people to know that Lalo Guerrero, for example, is a big deal here, right? He's the father of Chicano music. And that in 1987, he showed up and he performed for free at a gay and lesbian Latinos Unidos fundraiser because he wanted to be supportive. Now, I have the advertisement, I include that, because I want people to know about the interrelationships between people. I have a letter that Cesar Chavez wrote uh, to gay and lesbian Latinos Unidos saying, hey, you all, you have, you know, you have your rights, be who you are, be out there, be beautiful and celebrate yourself. This is 1983. So because I'm a historian, I use these documents to, to uh, to tell this history. And also I like writing memoirs because as I'm writing it, I, I feel like it's just my story. I don't have to like uh, tell everybody's story, but through telling my story, I think it tell, it, it's really uh, making an effort to tell that story of more people than just my family. But uh, yeah, Tucson is very grounding now to me. But, you would have asked me in my 20s, that would have been a different story. <laughs> and I know you mentioned a lot of names in there, and I became very interested to know what happened to some of the members from like the Lesbians of, of Color, Gay, Lesbian Unidos, or Lesbianas Unidas. I was very interested to know their story, or, or did they get connected with you, reconnected after you wrote the book, and did any share interesting stories or want to share anything that wasn't a part of the book? Uh, of course, you know, uh, I have to say that my mother was an archivist and she saved things in a good way, right? I've heard of other stories with her grandparents, and, uh, but she saved uh, documents that were really important and guided me through my, my work on the freeway. And when I left here, I saved documents too. So when I, I used those, the primary documents to guide my work, but I didn't really interview people. I, I sent emails to people, is it, by 1986, am I correct by saying that? And they would write back and say, yes, you're correct. But I never interviewed people because I didn't want to, first, it would have taken me a lot longer to write the book. And when I'm writing with, the, uh, with you know, using I, it's kind of easy, and then I said this, and then I went here. You know, it's a lot easier than when we, when I write, like La Calle, and it's more of an R or me. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I did it, but I, we still t stay in touch, and if some of you are interested on PBS, there's a documentary, Tarot de Unidad, Gay and Lesbian Latinos Unidos, on PBS, and if you, um, I have some cards here, if you want to pick up a card, it has the website, and it's going to be free for another six months. So there's actually, since my memoir, a documentary about the group, and that tells more of everybody's story. Because not everybody was uh, 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 doing what I was doing. And I was an uh, electrician, I was a blue collar worker, and I was building buildings in LA, and you know, doing that kind of work, and not everybody was doing that kind of work. So I thought that that, that was important just to tell that story because my fingerprints are all over all I need to it. This is a question for all three of you because all of you included those personal stories. There's the card, so make sure afterwards, come up here too. So all of you all included those personal narratives, names, places. What details did you all want to make sure to include in these latest projects? Um, whoever wants to take that question first, we'll go down the road. Sure, I, I think the details that I wanted to include were whatever memories I had. I think, uh, I mean, my book is called My Side of the River, so one of the things that I wanted to talk about was this river. And I, I say that it cuts Tucson from east to west. 
it cuts Tucson from east to west for some people, not for everybody. But for me, I felt like it cut Tucson from east to west because I saw, you know, how the south of it was very different from how the north, just through my experiences and my eyes. And I think that as I wrote, I, I almost um, kind of channeled that inner child. And you can kind of see my writing style progress. Like, it, it's a little bit um, infantile at the beginning. And it's just because that's how I saw Tucson. That's how I saw the world. And over time, I started to feel more rage. And I started to feel everything I saw about Tucson was with a little bit more anger and spite. And, you know, I also, I, I tried to balance that with also the beauty that Tucson brought me, the peace that it brought me, the mountains, like being in a valley, the, the way that there's so much contrast, it's, it's still a desert, but it's so green. And we've seen it rain. Uh, I just went to the Rio River a couple days ago, and like the whole, it's it's obviously dry, but all of the, the foliage is green in there. And it's, so I, I think the details that I included and the people that I included were just whatever memories I could scrape through my brain as I wrote this. I don't have the copies of the shadows with me. So one of the things I wanted to relate in LA interchanges is that people make mistakes. And that sometimes I think that young people put a lot of pressure on themselves to know who they're going to be or to chart out their journey. And so in LA interchanges, which is a photo, well, here it is. Instead of the freeway charting the course of my life, determining where I went to school, separating my community from the rest of the city, I'm talking the freeway. So I wanted to portray that, that I was, I landed in LA and I had a strong sense of, I'm gonna do something and I'm gonna make a difference. But along the way I made mistakes and I wanted to make sure to highlight those mistakes uh, because, uh, uh, you know, that's what life is about. Like we think we're going to be and become this. Like I have a PhD in history, never would I have thought that, but never would I have charted that out either. You know, my life is kind of meanders over here and it goes over here and I want I wanted to make sure that came across, that I wasn't so sure of what was gonna happen and that in the end, you know, I concluded by saying that you know, I felt embraced by LA. It, it, it allowed me to become who I became, and it, uh, I'm very thankful for those 20 years that I lived there. Uh, I was very surprised when I read all your electrical background. I said, Vivian, this is what's surprising me the most, your, your work that you did on all those buildings. And I got to crawl inside King Kong yeah. and fix King Kong. At Universal Studios. Studios. At Universal City Walk. How many people, King Kong's not even there anymore, but they're there. there. Oh, he's there. Oh, okay. I live down the street in North Hollywood and I see King Kong on my way to get coffee. <laughs> Well, what were those? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> says, Lydia, thank them for crawling inside me. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Henry, what were those little details that you wanted to? Oh yeah, no. I mean, speaking of mistakes, we all make mistakes, and some of us, I hope, will give us. And you know, um, I'm talking to one person here, so uh, it's funny to both of us. Um, the details was, uh, I guess, La Voz de Mayo was um, my great grandfather. He didn't want to take credit. I don't know. I mean, I'm the same way. Like, if you try to compliment me, I will tell you something horrible I did earlier today. Um, but uh, he didn't want credit. They would have named uh, in Old Pascua the park near R Ritchie Elementary School uh, after him. But he didn't want that. And uh, he didn't want any credit. Consequently, uh, made everyone else who helped um, go away. So that's why in the beginning of the book it's dedicated to the people who co-founded La Voz de Maya. Um, that's why I wanted to make a comic about Dolores Huerta and um, highlight her, but learning about her story, a lot of people she feels wasn't credited properly because a lot of the lion's share of the uh, migrant farm workers movement uh, goes to Cesar Chavez. I didn't know that the Filipino farm workers uh, started the Delano Bridge strike, and that's in the comments. So, um, 
the, the other thing, you know, I mean, that's the thing, it's just like, that's the kind of a reoccurring theme in my work, and uh, is to give credit where credit's due, um, even in spite of probably other opportunities, which thank you, Lydia, for mentioning, you know, the Raytheon uh, money that goes into this festival. I think there's other ways to fund this beautiful thing. I was just, I was, uh, I've been here for a week and I was working out of Himmel Park um, Library and this, this woman, uh, you know, she comes down, she sits next to me and she has the Tucson Festival books, like, newspaper. And she is like, like a child, her, like her fingers crossed, you know, chin on the table, crossing who she wants to see. So obviously this is a really important event to us. And this has uh, helped foster literacy, music, art, poetry, and everything you can think of. So I hope we can find ways to, to keep pumping money into this without it having to come from right beyond. Now, Lydia, you all have a wide range of experience in writing, and I know there's a lot of people in the audience that like to write. I have my daughters here that like to staple papers and write little books like you're sharing, Elizabeth. Um, for you all, what does your typical work day look like while you're writing? <laughs> yeah, whoever wants to jump on that one. I like, I like to write in the middle of the night. Uh, I say I do my best work in the dark. Uh, it is the hours from midnight to 3 a.m. where my phone isn't ringing, where it's there's no traffic, no people screaming, no doors opening. Um, also, there's a thing that people like to make writing very precious, and they like to romanticize the act of writing. Like they want to go to a coffee shop, and they want to like, you know, I might do my best work at the airport. <laughs> Honestly, like I can sit and I can pump out a script or write something. You really have to put all that that stuff away. Like, just, you know, don't. It doesn't have to be a coffee shop. It, you could sit anywhere, and as long as you have access to something like handwriting, typewriter, uh, you know, I used Final Draft, and that was only because it was a gift from a Hollywood screenplay writer and producer. And I couldn't afford it, so uh, w there's so many different ways to do to do this act that predates us. That um, is a it's it's, an, it's it's a craft. If you can learn the craft, if you can hone your craft, and um, I, I want to push this book, The Essence of Eloquence. Everybody should read this book. Uh, it will decode writing for you in a way that I felt like a monkey putting a stick into a hole and eating ants this whole time. That's how I feel like I've been treating writing. And the more you learn about it, the, the easier it gets, and the more you can trick people. It's like magic, you know? Like, you're, you're, you're literally performing card tricks, but with and, and therefore, and... <laughs> So when I when I was writing this, I, I work full time in tech, so I don't know how I was doing it. Probably with a lot of pain at night after wanting. I, I just wanted to be sleeping the entire time. I think the way that I write now is also not traditional. It's not like I. I sit down somewhere and I'm like, wow, look at this beautiful thing. Usually I'm in transition in some way. I'm at the airport or I'm on an Uber somewhere or I'm on the train and I have a thought and I put it in my notes app and then I hope that I can find it later. <laughs> and I usually don't. Somehow it goes to iCloud or it's saved on my work floor. And then I'm like, okay, well that sucks. Uh, so it, it, writing comes with me that way. I, I also have lots of stretches where I have no thoughts. It's just no inspiration. And then randomly I'll read something and I get I get so excited and I'm like, oh I have to like jot down these thoughts or this reaction. And then that's how things come to be right now. Um, I have been told that I should be writing some like short essay type things and every time I, I, they need to give me deadlines because if I don't have a deadline I don't do anything. And this is also at work, so it's just like I have to be in extreme pressure crunching situations to get anything out. And I think that's why airports help too, or airplanes, because they're like, I don't buy the Wi-Fi, I'm too cheap for that. <laughs> and so I'm just like, okay, I'm going to use this time to, to write something. Uh, but yeah, it, it's very chaotic. It's definitely not straightforward at all. I do want to mention when I wrote Lovos de Mayo and made Lovos de Mayo was over a five year period. I, at the last year, I was working three jobs. I was managing a donut shop, working for a comic book publisher, 
and I was uh, writing freelance as a as a culture writer for SciFi.com. So if you want to do this, it's going to take a lot of sacrifice. And going there. Oh, that's good. I told you that I'm older, right? So <laughs> I, I'm in bed by I'm in my pajamas by 6:30. Uh, I know when I asked Henry, and he's like, oh writes late at night, but uh, uh, I, uh, I I like to go, I have a schedule, I go to the, and it sounds very leisurely because I go to the gym, you know, a lot, and then I have, I uh, come home and I try to schedule lunch for someone, and then I come home and maybe write a little bit, but those are the days where I don't feel inspired and have a, a, a motivation, so every time I have a book, in my mind, I'm a real, like you, I doubt if you know a harder worker than I am. Like when I know I want to finish it, I'll just like dedicate and just get it, crunch it and get it done. Uh, right now I'm in this period of like, this book, or like interchanges just got released in July. So I'm still with the loose ends, tra going, traveling to LA a lot, but when that's done, I have this new book that I'm proposing in my head, and I'm just going to finish it and get it done. Uh, when I was an uh, advisor for graduate students and working on their dissertation, I would hear, what's the best dissertation? And I would say, hey, the best dissertation is a dumb dissertation because <laughs> it takes forever, right? And sometimes, if you finish your project, then you can give it to somebody else to read, read revisit it, or you you did revisit it, but it really is, the key is finishing it. So, uh, yeah, I don't really have a schedule right now, but it's, it's a, I'm very privileged to do have the schedule that I have. Well, besides writing at the airport, I was reading all of your work while waiting on a long layaway at the airport, so the airports are better, better places than I thought to get some work in. Now, I do have, some opportunity time for you all to ask some questions from the audience. Better be good. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering about book banning. What is it? Your gem, it seems like the books that you're writing are open for book banning. Uh, what's your opinion? But how can we stop it? What was the question? <laughs> I'm sorry. Book banning. How can we stop book banning? There is no stopping it. Unfortunately, we're all going to have opposing ideas and things that we, uh, you know, interpret. Um, I would say if you can and have the time to get involved with local, um, you know, school boards, local uh, city. Uh, government, even at the most basic level, we do need people to be more involved. I know I'm not going to be that person because I'll be making the books that they will be banning. <laughs> but we have to say no. We have to make sure books are available for everyone. And, um, you know, I think we're just at this point in this world where. Um, you know, it's it's becoming harder and harder to be inclusive and to be um, to be understanding of everyone's point of view. Uh, so, I hope that smarter and more capable people are able to become more involved with their local government, schools, and um, to stop these bigots from getting louder. The titles of my books all say Brown and Queer. Uh, so in my previous book, look, I doesn't say that, but uh, I doubt right now that any school district would acquire my book and use it, so it's not going to get banned because it's not going to get to that point uh, because they'd have to go through all this process just to get it in the classroom. From a marketing side, let me put a marketing. If your book is banned, it means great sales. And then it's great publicity for your book. That's the reality. On a very similar vein, I, I was going to say kids love 
to do things that are not allowed. And so it like from a maybe from like an educator perspective, it's a little bit of malicious compliance. Like, oh, these books are bad. <laughs> like it's too bad, but like you know, here's some places where you could get them, but like it's not allowed, you know, or something like that. I don't know, but yeah, from a marketing perspective, it, it's kind of a funny thing to do. Uh, yeah, I, I think like they're, 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 it's gonna continue happening. Obviously, I mean, like anything, if there's controversy, whatever, it gets the conversation going. Uh, it's up to us to kind of, you know combat those narratives and do whatever needs to get done and get these words to the people that want to read them. But yeah, I mean, I know the, the cartoonists that made Genderqueer, which was banned and painted Target on their back, or Air's back, and made life difficult. They can't go to book events like this without having security and without, you know, so uh, we, we can't tolerate this kind of activity. And, and we have to do everything we can to speak out against it. Question for Elizabeth, primarily. Just one, Elizabeth. I had, I just had a, a question mainly for for you, uh, but actually, it kind of follows from having done a memoir. It's, it's like, what's next? What's what's really driving? I mean, I hear like a real passion for you, Henry, in terms of taking lesser known historic figures and, and, and going for it. And of course, and, and Lydia, all of the, the work that you've done. So I'm curious for you, having finished a memoir, like what's lighting your fire now? What do you want to write about? Yeah, I, I don't know. I <laughs> it, it, Writing a memoir is very hard because it, it was very up to date. The last chapter was like what I was doing at that moment. So I, I do wonder what my next work will be. Will it be nonfiction? And so if it is, do I need to be doing things for the plot right now? Uh, <laughs> and should I be a little bit chaotic? Like, I don't, I don't really know what's going on. Uh, right now, I, I'm really focusing on you know my career. I, I'm quite junior where I am, and so I think there's a lot of areas to learn and grow from. And I, I don't know. I, I also really admire people that do fiction. I, I wonder because when I was proposed with writing a book, they're like, you can either write a memoir or you could do something that is sort of related to your life in a fiction way. And I was like, oh, I, my brain capacity is 50%. And I feel like fiction writers do 150%. I don't know how you create things like that. So it it's still a work in progress. I think that I need a lot more educating surrounding myself by authors and different books and writing and understanding to be able to see what the next steps are going to be. But uh, my agent has told me that this is going to be the first of many and I'm a little scared of her. So <laughs> I, I will be following suit. <laughs> Elizabeth, just make it up. Make it all up. So uh, Henry, <laughs> so it's on. <laughs> you, you took over a comic strip uh, it was sort of old, dated, uh, traditional uh, jock fodder, and you introduced uh, trans characters and, uh, and, and Muslim girl wrestlers and a bunch of other things that uh, the readers of Guild Thorpe uh, hadn't encountered before. Has there been much backlash to that? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, good question, Tom. <laughs> you can find Gil Thorpe in the sports section at the, uh, the Arizona Daily Star, uh, which I used to work with Tom and a lot of folks here. Mr. Portillo Jr., please give a round of applause to our journalists who have served the community, who are advocates of the community. But yeah, I took over a um, legacy comic strip called Gil Thorpe. It was very much like Leave it to Beaver. Uh, nothing, uh, anything that has anything to do with anything happening now was in it. Uh, and I want to back, I don't want to talk uh, badly about the last author, but um, if you um, look at the news ever, there is a lot of pushback on trans athletes. 
that's a big issue. Um, also, there was just no people, really people of color with any defining characteristics in it. Um, I, <laughs> I just talked to somebody who's a PIO for a Phoenix um, uh, like a police department and uh, they busted a kid who had a gun in his bag, but he was only had the gun in his bag for protection in school because he was selling uh, black market vapes. Real thing. Kids are selling vapes, and I did a storyline about vapes, and people made fun of me saying, no one sells vapes. But yeah, I get to, you know, that's the thing. It, Doing this strip has been a real rewarding experience. I write something every week, something comes out Monday through Saturday, and I get to talk about you know the things I want to talk about because uh, I don't know, I think I speak for everybody on this panel, but we don't have enough time to write and tell these stories and say what we have to say. So if you get the platform, if you get the opportunity, use it for something that you can look back on and be proud of. So I'm looking at the clock, you know, I was walking over here and I felt like I was your, your roadie going to a concert. <laughs> Henry was carrying a suitcase yep. and I felt like this concert was going to be a little longer, but it's an hour so we're going to have to close it out. I, uh, I just want to give a, spe a special thank you again to Nuestras Raices, the staff, thank you all so much. It's an honor for me to be up here moderating you all. I admire you all, and you all make me proud to say I'm from Tucson, so thank you. And a thank you to you all for being here. For all the readers, attending, for everyone that's supporting our local authors, please make sure to visit the tent. Book sales, the book sales area and author signings will be at Pima County Public Library, Nuestras Raices Stagecraft Tent area right here. Free bookmarks for the little ones or for the adults, hopefully. Um, and anything else before, any other announcements or anything else? The main book stage is uh, the main book stage area as well, right? For Lydia and Elizabeth. Okay. So stay safe, be well, and keep reading.